All right, everybody, the meeting's now being officially uh, recorded. And once again, we, uh, we missed the opening slides. Uh, we'll talk about what's going on at Benjamin Banneker, uh, but you can pick that up on the website. And uh, we'll, um, we'll uh, thank everybody once again. So um, with that said, um, it's now time to move to our, our guest speaker, our guest presenter, who we're really thrilled to have. And I'm going to ask our, uh, our friend and member uh, and webmaster, Ken Miller, to introduce our, our guest tonight. Ken? Did I just get changed to Ken Miller? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Ken Sal. <laughs> Ken Sal. Just want to see if you were paying attention. I'm I also going to, re I'm also going to, going to uh, uh, release my, um, my screen sharing so uh, he'll be able to get in there. Okay. Okay. I, I don't need okay. to share, but I'm no, just going to. But uh, Ron will, right. Okay. So uh, I, did, I first became aware of Ron Miller's work over 40 years ago in 1979 when I purchased a, a Starlog photo guidebook. This one here. Uh, and, if, and if that illustration on the cover looks familiar to some people, it's because it's a variation on Chesley Bonestell's 1944 painting, Saturn is seen from Titan. And actually that painting wraparound cover was um, by Bonestell at age 90, if you can believe it. Uh, but anyway, Ron uh, Miller, as you may know, is an author and illustrator specializing in space and astronomy. His work appears regularly in magazines like Astronomy and Scientific American, as well as others like Air and Space and Sky and Telescope, et cetera. He's the author of 70 books. Um, that number keeps growing. And several of which are listed on our meetings page. And one of which we actually have in the Hale Library, uh, which is the guided tour book. Um, although we have a really old version. I hope uh, we can have uh, talk with the board about getting a few more of his books in there. He also designed a set of postage stamps, which celebrating the expiration of the solar system, which I'll let him talk to you about and give you some really interesting details. But I do wanna say that I actually have those stamps and have had them uh, in, hanging in my house for 30 years, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, of course, I've never met Ron Miller. So this is a, a joy to me as well as ha you know, having him here for us. Um, and he's worked on motion pictures, most notably the 1984 David Lynch version of Dune um, and to find out more about his career, stay tuned to his presentation and you can look him up on Wikipedia. And with that, I turn it over to Ron Miller. Well, Ron, welcome. Hello. Let me get to share screen here and um, see if I can do this. There we go. Hang on one second. <laughs> Oops, I don't want that. Yeah, I, um, I told Kenneth uh, when he uh, signed me up for this that um, I didn't really so much want to do a talk or a lecture, because um, that's me telling you guys what I think you, I think you want to hear or should hear. I want to make it more conversational, but before I do that, maybe I thought I would give a little background, maybe a little history of space art a little bit. And uh, then kind of open it to questions and things. So we make it conversational. So I, I can maybe tell you folks what you want to know rather than what I think you ought to know. Um, I was going to have a PowerPoint uh, presentation, but my PowerPoint exploded. So I had to do the next best thing. Um, the, uh, you brought a Chesley Bonacell. Are you seeing this, by the way? Yes. Okay, good. Making sure it's all working. Well, Chesley Bonestell was probably the who got me into space art when I was a kid in the 1950s. And you know, the heyday of um, you know interest in space travel. You know, the Mercury program was just gearing up. Sputnik has been launched, and space was everywhere. And I remember as a little kid in elementary school searching out this guy's paintings. The, the man with a funny name I couldn't pronounce. 
I'm not happy with what and, I um, done. <laughs> this Hey, everybody, if you can, excuse me, Ron, if everybody could mute. Um, and then if you have a question, thanks. Go ahead, Ron, sorry. Pardon? Am I good to go? Yeah, you're good, yep. Okay. This opinion has been described as being the opinion that launched a thousand careers, which is absolutely true. Um, there are scores of astronomers, uh, astronauts, uh, um, astrophysicists, um, scientists who became what they are because of this painting specifically. Um, it's no longer accurate, of course. Uh, we know you know that Titan has a uh, you know, an opaque orange atmosphere, but that doesn't really make any difference. Um, is the effect this painting has had, and it's done in 1944, the same year that Titan's atmosphere was discovered. So you got to cut Monticello a little slack. Um, this is this is a this is really, you might find this really interesting because this is really in your neighborhood. This is the 40-foot lunar mural that Chesley Bonacell did for the uh, Hayden, uh, Hayden Planetarium in uh, Boston in uh, the 1950s. Um, after the Apollo landing, they took this thing down because it wasn't accurate any longer and put in storage. It's now restored and back up again for public viewing at the National Air and Space Museum. And is, I've seen it. I saw it when it was first unrolled, when they first unpacked it. And it is absolutely spectacular. So if you get a chance to see this thing, it's in the new Apollo Hall at the Air and Space Museum, which by the way is, the name of the hall is Destination Moon, which is a tip of the hat to both Bonacell and the classic movie. Um, but this is, this is a beautiful painting. Um, a uh, 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 passing over the South Pole of the Moon by Bonacell. Uh, this was done in the late 19, but I think I think I think this was about 1946 or 47. Um, and you can see why he was so influential on me and a thousand other people. The creator Theophilus. I mean, this 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 this. I know Bonacell's moon is no longer really accurate, but I think it's the moon's fault. This is how the moon should have looked. Uh, Saturn scene from Mimas. This is, for, this is first published in Life magazine in 1944. Mercury. Any questions, pipe up. Uh, Bonacell eventually collaborated with Werner Von Braun and Willie Lay on a series of magazine articles for Collier's Magazine uh, in the early 1950s. Um, this is a space telescope, about the same size as, uh, as the Webb telescope now. Um, this is only the second depiction of a space telescope in history, uh, you know, visually. The first one was in 1929. Uh, I have hundreds and hundreds of uh, illustrations of Bonacell. I had to pare it down a little bit. Uh, this is the uh, Werner von Braun uh, a Mars glider for his Mars mission. And uh, I've, I've always thought this is the sexiest spaceship <laughs> ever created. It's just beautiful. Um, the uh, Von Braun Mars fleet uh, being prepared in Earth orbit for launch to Mars. These are the Mars lighters for the landing, and these are uh, personnel and supply uh, ships that accompany them. But this stuff absolutely floored me when I was a kid. Um, I actually, when I worked for the Air and Space Museum, I had the original painting of this hanging in my office. And uh, I learned a lot simply from having, this is the first original Bonacell I ever saw in my life. 
and I had a hanging in my own office. And um, it was a, uh, it was like having a, I know, a, a crucifix hanging, <laughs> hanging there. Um, it was a dream come true for me. But even, even in the 1950s, Bonnestill's depiction of Mars, except for the blue sky, was really accurate. Um, look at those sand dunes and the dust devils, especially here. Except for the blue sky, this is what Mars looks like. Um, I find it really interesting how prescient Bonnestell was. Uh, this is a painting called Zero Hour, Zero Hour Minus Five. It was first published, I think it was 1946 or 47. This is 70 years ago. And uh, here's Elon Musk. Mar uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Bonnestell's uh, Mars rocket sitting on Mars, Elon Musk. Bonnestell's spacecraft taking off from Mars, 1950, Elon Musk. And um, the same scene was replicated in the uh, movie that Bonnestell worked on, Conquest of Space. There it is. So I think Bonnestell kind of nailed it. He may have gotten the moon wrong, but he nailed everything else. Um, before I get into my own artwork, I wanted to maybe show you a couple of artists who influenced Bonnestell. You know, Bonnestell didn't invent space art. Um, the uh, get back up here. Um, there is an artist, a British artist named Scriven Bolton, um, who worked in the 1920s. He had an incredible technique where he would build um, plaster models, photograph them, and then paint into them. He was an amateur astronomer. Um, uh, uh, wasn't, wasn't a professional artist at all. He did these for fun. But the effect is pretty amazing. And, um, oh, this is, uh, this, is, this is, I think, the first attempt to depict Pluto after its discovery. It's a plaster model that uh, Scriven Bolton built uh, for the Illustrated London News. This is published in 1929. So this is actually Planet X. This is actually, this, is, this was published before Pluto was discovered as a, uh, a, a, a speculation of what Pluto might look like the year before it was discovered. And another uh, view of the Earth uh, from the Moon by Scriven Bolton. Again, this is in the late 1920s, and Bonnestell still was working for the same magazine that Scriven Bolton was. And so Bonnestell still saw these things. Another artist who uh, uh, influenced Bonnestell was Lucien Rudeau. Come on, here we go. He was a French amateur astronomer and illustrator who worked in the 1930s and 40s. And what I find really amazing about Rudeau is his depiction of the moon. Uh, where Bonestell is famous for having these craggy alpine landscapes, Rudeau's moon looked like Apollo photos. Uh, this is the, uh, the eclipse of the, earth, uh, of the sun by the earth. This is Venus by Rudeau, done in 1927. Um, another illustration of the moon by Rudeau. Once again, this is, this is the late 1920s. And um, Rudeau explained why he didn't paint the moon with the craggy mountains that Bonnestell did and, and Bolton did and hundreds of artists did. He simply said, if you look at the moon through a telescope and you look at the limb of the moon against the black sky, you can see the mountains in profile. And you can see that they're rounded and eroded, just as the, the Apollo astronauts found they were. So all the people who were surprised by the moon being kind of looking like North Dakota shouldn't have been. Uh, they were really influenced by Bonnestell and the artists who followed him. Um, the root Rudeau absolutely got it right. 
Um, this is Mars seen from um, what, uh, probably Phobos, I guess, um, by Rudeau in 1927. Saturn seen from Rhea. Again, this is 1927. You know, it's amazing. You know, the light being reflected from the ring onto the backside of uh, Saturn. Saturn's rings seen from Saturn. He gave it a solid surface because, you know, hey, it was 1929, they didn't know any better. Getting closer to the equator, the ring seen from the equator. I find this really neat. Uh, this is 1943, uh, and here is Rudeau showing spokes in the ring that were later photographed you know, by Cassini. But, he, but uh, Rudeau was a fan, fabulous observer. He had his own observatory in France. And he was a good enough observer that he, uh, he saw these spokes that were such a big surprise um, when Voyager and Cassini saw them. Even the depictions of the Earth, as it might seem be seen from space, were really accurate. There were no, you know, um, weather satellites <coughs> or anything, but he, he reconstructed this from weather reports from around the world to see what the world looked like from space, uh, and he, he nailed it. And Bonner still, again, worked for the same newspapers that these guys worked with. So uh, Bonner still was heavily influenced by these two artists. Um, I wanted to show you something that um, Bonnet still did. Um, his most famous painting I just showed you was, of course, Saturn from Titan. This is the original sketch he did. He did this while he was still working in Hollywood as a special effects matte painter. Uh, this, is, this is around 1941, 42. From that, he did this sketch. And from that, he built a model, much like Scriven Bolton did. It's a plaster model, um, plaster and clay. He was able to take that, that model and light it from different angles, uh, much like he would do a digital model today, except he was as a three-dimensional model. Once he got the lighting correct and the way he liked it, he made a photograph, a large photographic print, mounted it down and painted on top of it to get his, his famous painting, um, which is really a tinted photograph of this model here. Um, so that's all kind of background. <laughs> so um, I did find that Bonacel, while he wasn't right about the moon, his Basic idea wasn't wrong. Um, these are this, this is matches up uh, Bonacel's uh, picture of um, uh, Saturn seen from Neapolis. Well, here's a very similar scene um, taken by the Rossetti lander on a comet. Um, let's see here. Uh, is that what I wanted to show you? Oh, uh, Bonisto on the left, Rossetti on the right. Uh, Bonisto's uh, picture of Pluto from 1950 looks very much like what you'd see in the Pluto uh, Mount Zone Pluto uh, photographed by New Horizons. Uh, the Straight Wall on the Moon by Bonisto from 1950. Well, we got the straight wall on uh, Mar uh, Miranda. So there's, there's very Bonestellian landscapes all around. This is, there are no mountains on the moon that look like this, but Tolhill Mons on um, Io would be a twin. So anyway, so Bonestell may have been wrong about the moon, but he wasn't necessarily wrong about getting that kind of landscape. There are landscapes like that you know, out there in the um, in the solar system. Um, anyway, um, so when I was a kid, um, Bonacel was a huge influence on me. 
And I was doing a commercial art when I was, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. That's good enough. Um, to sort of kill the, I was doing ads for toasters and real estate and refrigerators and things. So I get home, I was sorry, I thought, I'll try doing some of my own space art. So this is my first attempts at doing space art uh, back actually in the 19, early 1970s. Um, I'll just flip through a few of these. These are all acrylic paintings. And these are yours, Ron? These are mine now. Okay, great. And see, these are all about, uh, these are all like 40 years old. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so um, so I I, uh, I saw an ad for some prints of Chesley Bonestell, so I ordered one. I sent a letter along with it saying, I don't know if Mr. Bonestell is still alive or not, but man, please tell him if he is. You know, I've, he really influenced my life, and I love astronomy and space. Well, it turns out Bonestell was still alive. And uh, his manager, who answered the letter, told me that... Uh, by the way, do you know there's gonna be a new air and space museum and there's gonna be a planetarium there? Why don't you apply for a job there? So I figured, oh, well, why not? <laughs> so uh, I did and I got the job. So really through Chesley Bonestell, not only influenced me to do my artwork, but almost directly, I got a job as a as a uh, space artist. This, oh, here we go. This is the very first, space paint I ever did in my entire life. I did this in 1968. Um, I still have it. <laughs> and um, so it's a, it's historic, <laughs> I guess. Um, back up here a little bit. Uh, in the last um, 20 years, I've been working mostly digitally. And in the, because of COVID, <laughs> I've um, had a lot of time on my hands. So I decided to get my paints out again and start painting traditionally. And so in the last two years, I've done about two dozen um, traditionally, traditional media paintings again. And it was a lot of fun getting my hands back in the paint. And so I thought I'd show some of these before I show some of my uh, more regular work. Um, Jupiter seen from Europa. If there's any questions, please pipe up. I'll, I'll answer as best I can. Um, I can't remember the title of this one. This, 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 this is an eclipse of a, um, oh, this is Myra Seti, I think. Yeah, this is an eclipse of Myra Seti, and it's a little red dwarf companion. So, Ron, when you uh, create a picture like this, are you doing it from memory or did you have a sketch or a picture from something in the past that you were using as a reference? How did you uh, formulate it from your head to your fingers? To the it's kind of made up as I go along. Uh, I mean, I kind of know what the thing's gonna look like in the sky, you know, um, and the landscape is kind of uh, evolves. Um, I might have a, sometimes I have a rough sketch uh, just for the composition. And um, sometimes these things are as a big a surprise to me when they turn out as they are to anybody else. Um, very, very early Mars. Um, this eruption is melting some subsurface ice and uh, causing a flood. Um, question. Yes. So these paintings, they come straight from your imagination. And so do you get your rough sketches from books? Do you know, read the description of what they look like or is it just plain off memory? Well, it's kind of complicated. Um, I mean, I'm doing this for a very, very long time. So a lot of the information is things I already know. I mean, I know how Uranus looks or Mars looks. Um, um, other times I'll, there'll be a new discovery 
I think, ooh, that sounds interesting. So and that requires a lot more research. I'll have to find out what something looks like and, and do, do uh, and look things up. So it's kind of a combination of things. Um, um, this experience, you know, um, you know, if you, you do, if you paint Mars often enough and studied enough, you kind of know what it looks like. Uh, but sometimes if something's really new, I have to uh, look things up or talk to people. So it kind of depends a little bit on the picture. Um, like this one is uh, Uranus seen from, I think it's Ariel. Well, yeah, I've, I've done this before. I know how big Uranus should be. I know what it looks like. I know uh, kind of what, you know, Ariel's kind of icy. So I, I know all the basic details. So I can kind of, uh, you know, kind of just make it all up and, and have it come out right. So it kind of depends on the picture. Okay, thank you. Yeah, in fact, back, back, uh, backing up here a little bit. That's the most recent one. I just did, oop, that, <laughs> too fast. I did that one last week. So that, that's the new, that's the most recent one I've got. Um, here's some astronomer, uh, astronauts exploring a, um, a, uh, uh, a volcanic tube on Mars and discovering ice in it. And sort of a generic Mars, no place, no place special, just Mars. I like Mars. Because it's pink. <laughs> How long does it take you on average from start to finish on a single picture? I'll give you an answer that Chesley Bonestell, similar to what Chesley Bonestell said one time. Somebody asked him that. How long does it take to do a picture? And he said, it takes about a week and 40 years of experience. <laughs> so I would say these take maybe two or three days and 40 years of experience. Um, if I were to sit down, I've done one of these things before. If I had never done one in my life, it'd probably take a month. But after a while, you just know what you're doing. Um, you know what to expect when you put something down. So it's complicated. <laughs> it's, it's really not a very easy answer. Ron, how did you get the uh, the this is this is the second most recent one. They did this one about three weeks ago. This is Pluto with Charon in the sky, and the sun. I have a particular fondness for Pluto. I have a kind of a proprietary interest in Pluto, I think. You mentioned the stamps. Um, one of those stamps is a Pluto stamp, and the stamp says, Pluto not yet explored. And before they launched the New Horizons spacecraft, they put one of those stamps on the spacecraft. There's, there's a stamp attached to it. And that stamp is now in the Guinness Book of World Records as having traveled further than any other stamp in history. Um, I, um, I, do hope though that they got the thing canceled first. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to come right on back. <laughs> oh, and this is another Mars. I did this from last last summer. I'm mean, not Mars. I mean uh, Pluto. This was last summer. I think. Oh, and oh, okay. The, and this one is really recent. This is just a couple of weeks ago. Another, another Pluto picture. Um, it's, little, it's got an icy, it has this icy uh, atmosphere. So I gave it sun dogs and a halo, uh, which I thought might, might occur in its, in its, you know, ice crystals in its atmosphere. I think that's the last one of this. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no one more. Um, Saturn seen from Iapetus. Question. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming. These have just been spectacular to look at and I've learned so much. I was wondering, do you sell prints of your uh, paintings? Uh, yes and no. Um, there's a thing called Society Six. 
that I can make a print available through. So if somebody contacts me, if they, if they want a print of a specific painting, I can make it available through the website called Society6. And then you can and, and you can go there and order whatever size you want of whatever pic, whatever picture it is. I I'll up, I upload the picture you want. Uh, Nova Space uh, in Tucson. It's a gallery that uh, specializes in space art. Uh, you can look at, look it up online. It's, it's novaspace.com, and they have some prints of my work, and they also have. Uh, Gosh, about two dozen original paintings. Um, and as well as a lot of other space artists. It's, it's well worth checking out their uh, website. Um, it's it's novaspace.com. So either either way, just, just drop me an email and, and I, I can, I'll, I'll give you more information. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, but for the last 20 years, I have done... Um, Mostly, um, get this bigger here. Here we go. I've been working digitally, um, mainly because it's much, much easier to meet my deadlines. Um, I really resisted for a long time working with my computer because I was afraid things would look generic. Um, so I finally gave in when I had to. I had to, um, I, had, I, had to do, I had to do 10 books. I had to write them and illustrate them. And I had to do one book every two months. I realized there's no way in the world I could do all the paintings I had to do. So I said, okay, I'll, um, I'll break down, I'll do it digitally. And so I showed my first digital paintings around and my space art colleague said, oh, those look just like Ron Miller paintings. And that's all I needed to hear. So I realized that compositionally, uh, color, all of the things that really made my pictures look like my pictures didn't change, which is the way they were done. So, um, um, so for like 22 years now, all my commercial work, my book for books and magazines, I've been painted digitally. So I thought I picked out about a dozen here. Um, just to show you just at random, some of the, uh, some of the some of, some of the better ones are maybe but and don't ask me don't ask me the titles of some of these because sometimes I forget what, especially stars they have these really complex names <laughs> I, I can't remember them for the life of me <laughs> so oh this is this is a this is early Pluto um, back when it was still um, uh, undergoing uh, uh, some volcanism and had liquid uh, water on its surface so this is this is Pluto, um, maybe two billion years ago. This is the uh, uh, little um, dragonfly um, drone. They, they're hoping NASA is hoping to launch into Titan uh, uh, to explore Titan sometime. I hope in the near future, because um, I really, really, really like Titan, and I would love to see what that place looks like. Uh, seen from a dr flying drone. My, uh, two of my favorite subjects to, to illustrate are Titan and Pluto. Um, this, is one of the tea, this is one of the tea garden planets. I forget which one, <laughs> so you have to forgive me about that. Um, but it's, 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 it's a, 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 a a group of planets orbiting a, a red dwarf star. And this is one of them. Question. Yes. So your paintings, do you draw them on canvases or paper? Oh, the, oh, the, the painting paintings I showed earlier are acrylic paintings on illustration board. The illustration board is like a really, really heavy cardboard with a special surface on it for painting. And the paint itself is acrylic. Um, it paints like oils, but it dries very quickly. Um, the digital ones are just done with my, you know, I, I paint with my computer. I have a, a tablet and a little stylus. And it's, it's like painting, painting, but 
it's just, uh, but there's no mess. <laughs> and it's easy to make, fix, fix things. So, um, so that, that's, how, that's how those are done. Um, this is a collision of, a, uh, of the moon with uh, 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 an early planetoid in the early formation of the uh, solar system. Titan again, because I like Titan. This is the, uh, the foothills of Titan's uh, mountains. It's a little methane waterfall. Venus. Uh, uh, an asteroid has uh, hit Mars and it's causing a tsunami as it uh, melts all its subsurface ice. Valus Marineris. Zoom this up a little bit. There we go. We're exploring it over here. <laughs> little guy up here. Ah, Oumuamua. <laughs> I've done uh, half a dozen illustrations of this thing. Um, depending on who you're talking to, what it might look like. I did this for Scientific American. Um, the idea of its authors being that Oumuamua was a con uh, conglomerate uh, object. You know, I, uh, um, which is what explains its lumpiness. I've also done an illustration of it as a solar sail. Uh, it depends who you're talking to, what the thing might have been. Now, uh, this was fun to make. Um, I didn't paint this one. I built a model down in the basement. Um, it's made of clay and gravel and cat litter and all kinds of things. I, I sort of breaded the thing in, in rubble and then photographed it. And they went back in and painted on it. So, uh, so digital painting sometimes gets, lets, lets me do really creative things like this, which harks back to Chesley Bonnestell using models in um, creating some of his artwork. Uh, Io. I like Io too. I think there's a couple Io pictures here. There's another one. It's a typical landscape on Io. It's Europa. Um, question. Pardon? Oh, sorry, Wait. I had a. Okay, this oh, is okay. Tuh Tuhil Mons. Uh, this is sort of a Matterhorn-like peak of sulfur on um, on Io, which I thought might make would be an impressive thing to see if you could get there and see it. Exploring Europa. It's a little bigger. Europa again. Explore. There's a couple of explorers down here with, with their flashlights. Let's make this bigger here. There we go. There we go. Europa. Oh. Geysers of Enceladus. Another one of my favorite subjects. I've done a lot of pictures of, of Enceladus. Uh, I think it's seeing these things in real life have, has been one of the would have to be one of the prettiest things in the solar system. Uh, Carolyn Por I consulted with Carolyn Porco on doing my Enceladus pictures. And she told me that these things come erupting out of these fissures down here with pretty much the force of a jet engine. So if you were there, these things would be just, uh, uh, would be shaking the ground. So I try to kind of get that jet engine effect across. Um, this is after a methane rain on Titan. There's a storm has just passed. You can see it out here. And um, liquid methane is running off the, the rocks and flowing into this methane river. Uh, Pluto again, because I really like Pluto. 
I've probably done more pictures of Pluto than any other planet. Um, if you want to see more pictures of Pluto, I can easily do that for you. Rosetta um, approaching, I did this for um, Astronomy Magazine, um, showing Rosetta approaching uh, its comet. Again, for this, I actually, I built a three-dimensional model of the comet um, out of clay and uh, other materials, and then photographed it uh, in William Bonestell again. Uh, my theory actually is that nothing looks more real than the real thing. So make it out of real stuff. A protostar jetting. Betelgeuse, um, a flare on Betelgeuse, I should be more specific. Oh gosh, I can't remember the name of this thing. Um, it's this multiple star system with um, asymmetric rings around it. Uh, I, should make, I should have made notes before I put this together. As I said, I'm terrible about remembering the names of some of these places, I'm sorry. This is a fairly recent discovery. Uh, just just a month, a few months ago, a pulsar planet. Uh, my idea was that a pulsar would put out so much energy that it would cause uh, tremendous auroras around any planet orbiting it. So um, these are auroras on a, on a, on a pulsar pulsar orbiting exoplanet. So Ron, do you have a do you have a list of um? things that you want to do and you're kind of working from your list or is there a news event that catches your attention and inspires you for the moment? Uh, what, what happens to give you an idea oh. besides somebody asking you from oh, there's, there's always news. Thing. Actually, uh, a lot of these were taken from my um, uh, uh, in the news folder on my website. Um, I'm, uh, I'm always looking at new things uh, being discovered and thinking, wow, what would that look like? <laughs> so, yeah, I, I thought of that all the time. Um, this, this is the uh, most recent one of all. This was in the January issue of Scientific American. And it's the aftermath of the collision of the Milky Way galaxy with Andromeda. And both galaxies are unwinding each other um, and one of the results was, well, this is so far in the future, the sun's a red giant. And it's thrown Pluto out of the solar system entirely. Um, so this, this, this is the, um, the collision of Andromeda and the Milky Way seen from Pluto as both the sun and Pluto are being thrown out of the solar system. It was pretty apocalyptic. Do you ever draw Earth in the foreground? Pardon? I thought Pluto, well, I thought Pluto would be more fun. I like Pluto. Do, do you ever draw photos with Earth as part of the? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Uh, whenever it's appropriate, yeah. Uh, I can show you some. Um, um, in fact, I was, I was going to, um, move on to my main um, online portfolio so you guys can kind of pick and choose what you'd like to see after I finish this. Um, this is the, a flare star, um, a red dwarf flare star. Um, once again, these electro the electromagnetic pulses from these coronal discharges are causing massive auroras in this planet. Uh, Proxima Centauri, and since, Pro, uh, since uh, Proxima Centauri is a flare star, it's causing auroras, and this right there, that's, that's the sun, that's our sun right there, seen from Proxima Centauri. Wave hello. Uh, 
and Sun. This is for Scientific American again. Um, uh, a, uh, a better than Earth. There are uh, a, there's a class of exoplanets that might be better than Earth for the evolution of life. There are larger planets. Um, this cre creates a, a flatter landscape with shallower seas. Uh, and the shallower seas are a little more conducive to the, evol you know, the, the beginning, the evolution of life. So these planets might actually be better than the earth for life to form. And there, there, there are some out there. Um, Trapp this is the uh, innermost of the Trappist planets, uh, Trappist, I guess, B. And these are all the, uh, the next four out. Planets are so close to one another that they would appear like moons in, their, in each other's sky rather than, this, uh, rather than uh, bright stars. They're, it's a really, really close system, but they're all Earth-sized, which is really cool. Another Trappist planet. I think this is Trappist C. On uh, Neptune. Triton. Uh, this is an exoplanet. It's um, it's basically it's, it's raining iron. <laughs> and, uh, I once again I forget the name of the exoplanet. So I'm, 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 I am awful about uh, some of the names of some of these places. I apologize again. And we're back where we started. What I could do, if you have some questions, is I could go to my This is my main online gallery um, where I have literally every illustration of I have ever done. So if there's anything you'd like to see uh, subject wise, um, you know, um, from the sun to from the sun to, you know, life in the universe or hyperbell objects, you know, let me know. I'd be glad to. Uh, comments, comments and meteors, please. <laughs> OK, you spoke up first. Uh, where are they? <laughs> Comets and meteors are, here they are. Well, see, there's a lot of them. So let's see here. What would you like to see? Um, here's a comet in uh, Jupiter space. There's um, the Philly lander. Let me pick one here. Let's see here. Um, oh, I told you about Mua. Mua. Here's here it is as a uh, solar sail, a well-worn one. It's traveled a long way. It's been punctured a lot by meteors and asteroids. Uh, let's see here. Um, here's a comet breaking up. I don't know, would you like to see? Um, go back to the main, main, main collection. Somebody else pick a subject. Pick the sun. The sun. Okay. The sun is a red giant. And um, melting, Melted everything except this Mayan uh, 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 pillar. <laughs> there's a, um, here's so the there, sun is a red, well, there's red Earth, giant, right. huh? There's our Earth foreground right there. We, uh, <laughs> I couldn't hear you. Uh, I said, there is our Earth foreground we, I was asking about earlier. Not quite, this is Europa being thawed by a red giant sun. Not quite. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, the previous one. Yes, yes, you're right. 
Yeah, the previous one. Yeah. Um, yeah. You're right. Let's see. Ah, uh, the future sun, Helioflash. Disasters are always fun. Let's okay. see. Um, oh, okay, who's next? Ron, how about the uh, total eclipse you had there? And have you ever seen a total eclipse? Once in my life. Um, gosh, it must, must have been 20 years ago or more. <laughs> Um, I, I saw the part, I saw the, uh, the eclipse a couple of few years ago, um, but it wasn't total where I lived. It was just, it was just not quite total. Uh, I'd like to. So have you ever uh, seen a total eclipse? You say you have years ago? I, it was, yes, it was, it was 20 or 30 years ago though. So, um, uh, but I, I miss, I miss the most recent totality totality um so wasn't able to travel that far to see it let's see um we haven't done much in the way of stars and galaxies oh i know it'd be fun wait a minute hold on the earth hang on a second if the uh, if the earth's here, here, here's the moon seen from the Earth. What if we replace the moon with planets at the same distance? Uh, there's Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter. There's the shadow of the Earth <laughs> on Jupiter. Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Um, I like this series too. What if the Earth had a ring like like Saturn? What would it look like? This is from Quito, Ecuador. It's on the equator. That's all you'd get. A little further north in um, uh, Yucatan, about 20 degrees north latitude. Over Atlantic City, for Washington, but you get up around uh, in Alaska, that's all the ring you'd see. The equinox, your shadow will be cut, cut straight across because it's because uh, um, the. Uh, uh, the suns, the 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 earth, the, the, we're, 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 the, 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 the our axis is at right angles to the uh, direction of the sun. Sun's just over here, so all this side of the planet's in shadow. So it's really too bad we don't have a ring. Would it be cool? <laughs> um, so well, um, um, I love. Uh, I love your art. I'm trying oh, to be an you. artist myself. Um, and a space artist, I think there's a couple of us in here that are trying to do this. Um, I want to, I want to see what you're doing. I want to see, um, you, I was a fan of Robert McCall, oh. um, from NASA, a little bit more of a space artist too. Oh yeah. And um, I knew him well. He, um, yeah. Okay. And I, I am now absolutely a fan of yours. I, I think I've seen your work in a lot of memes, by the way, that scared a lot of people into thinking Saturn was going to crash into us or something. But um, I, do you do any of the futuristic stuff? I've seen you do some of the um, exploration where you show the guys on the, on the moon and uh, in different areas. I love that stuff. And I, I um, was curious if you had any uh, futuristic stuff. I kind of shy away from doing hardware a lot. Uh, probably because I'm, I'm more interested in the astronomy. The, I'm more interested in the places we're going to than how we get there. Um, that combined with the fact that I don't really paint hardware really well. 
<laughs> so I try, it's always a struggle for me. So um, I'll leave pictures of spacecraft and things like that, you know, to people. Well, I can't leave the Bob McCall anymore. He's not with us any longer. But to people who are more expert at, um, at depicting hardware than I am. So that's why you, most of my spacecraft you see will be kind of sitting down in a corner, not very large. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't really enjoy doing hardware <laughs> very much. Uh, in fact, actually a lot of, in the digital artwork, a lot of the art, hardware you see are actually models my wife built for me. Wow. So um, I'm, I'm, that bad, I'm that bad at it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that, that's so cool. It was, it was no. very neat to see. Um, but yeah, I have a huge, a huge, a huge admirer of Bob McCall. He was just incredible. Um, I uh, I visited his studio um, about five or six years before he passed away. And it was it was more of a pilgrimage than it was a visit. So, um, Ron, can you tell us uh, some places in the Washington area? That we could actually see some of your paintings um, in person. That's a good question. Uh, I know the Air and Space Museum owns several, but I don't know what's on display at any one time. So um, that's, that's a tricky question. Um, uh, I guess the real answer is I don't know. Um, where you can see originals um, here, of course, <laughs> but um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an extra four hours drive <laughs> south of DC. So, um, but, uh, but I said, the Smithsonian has quite a few from when I used to work there, um, but um, I don't think they're on display, unfortunately. Hey, Ron, have you done anything with um, nebulas or star clusters? Oh, let's see. Stars and galaxies. Let's see what we got. Oh, look here. <laughs> I think maybe the answer might be yes. <laughs> right. uh, gosh, how many are there? Oh, there's 196, it says. So. Uh, well, you pick your best um, ones because we don't have, uh, we don't have enough time for that. <laughs> 196. Oh, here we go. Here's um, the uh, little solar nursery in which our sun was born. These are our sister stars. Let it come up here. There we go. Um, if I can move this thing out of the way. Oh, there we go. Now I got shock waves from a supernova. Uh, causing uh, star star formation in these clouds, a protostellar nebula, a protostellar eggs is all going to become stars. Protostellar jet, uh, jetting, I, I, sh I showed you this one. This is our this is our protostellar system and the remnants of the nebula that was formed in the protostellar disk. This is Algol, Altair, Delta Cephei, large and small, uh, Red Dwarf Planet. Yeah, there's a lot. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Would you like to see specifically anything specific? Um, when Betelgeuse was making all its news, I did several different pictures showing what might be causing its variation in, in brightness. One was that it might be covered with big, great big sunspots. So this is Betelgeuse's sunspots. Uh, Betelgeuse as a flare star, again. Uh, Betelgeuse, it might've been a dark cloud either orbiting it or passing in front of it that might have caused some of its, 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 its variation in, in, in color. And Betelgeuse is exploding. This is Betelgeuse as a nova, as it might look in Chesapeake Bay. 
Uh, let's see here. There's a lot of stuff. <laughs> oh, to, the, to, everybody out, excuse me, to everybody out there, we only have a few more minutes for Ron. So if you have any requests or questions, okay. now's the time. Sure. Is there Speak any up. planet around the here. black hole? Go ahead, Robert. Is there any planet around black holes? Uh, oh, black holes oh, way down here. Yeah, I got lots of black holes. Um, let's see here. I'll run through real quickly here. Here's a black hole tearing the last story apart. There's a black hole. There's another one. Take a second here. So these larger ones take a second to load up. There we go. Oh, it's a diagram. Black hole consuming a star. The star is being torn apart and sucked into the black hole. This is for Scientific American again. Hawking radiation. There you go. And a cluster of proto galaxies. That's another black hole. So you got your black holes. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted the black holes. I got you some black holes. <laughs> Any last questions for Ron? Hey, Ron, I got to tell you, it's um, it's humbling and awesome to see what you've done. I mean, not just the quality of the work, but the quantity and the diversity. It's it's it's. It, it's kind of like trying to capture with a camera uh, a large landscape where you can't really get it, you know, the same way you get it when you stand over the Grand Canyon and you see it, but you've taken everything from so many different areas and, and just well, brought life to things all over the place. It's, 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 it's hard to explain when I go home, what we just witnessed. Well, one of the reasons I do these things at all is because it's, it's really the only way I will ever be able to visit these places. So uh, if I would do a picture of Mars, I gotta hold my breath and pretend I can't breathe. I'm really on Mars when I'm doing it. <laughs> um, so I really, really believe in these places. I think they're real places with real landscapes and they're not made up things. I try to get that quality across. So if somebody looks at them, I don't want people to think I've made these up out of whole cloth. I want people to think that, oh, it's a real place. I could go there and visit it someday. That's, that's really my goal. That's great. I mean, just fantastic. We want to thank you very much well, for everything. I hope you, you know, maybe be able to uh, stay by and catch some of the, uh, the next presentation and some of the, um, uh, the work that, uh, that our, our own members have done. Uh, oh, I up. hope so. Yeah. I might have to go, I might have to leave in a few minutes, but I'll, I'll hang around as long as I can. All right, very good. Well, thank you very much, Ron. And thanks, well, Ken, for, uh, for, uh, for finding Ron and then bringing him to us. Sure. Well, thanks, it's thank a pleasure. You, I don't know how to stop sharing. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. I got it. Um, okay. There we go. Up there. There you go. There we go. All right. Well, thank you very much once again. So we're really blessed today, not only from having Ron and having you know Steve's presentation before, uh, but we have our own our Zoom. Um, our Zoom is uh, is well known to uh, most of you on this call, and uh, to tell you a little bit about our Zoom. Uh, that you may not know, uh, he's uh, he's 11.8 years old, and he's the only person I've ever asked in my 63 years how old they are, and I got a decimal place. So uh, you know he's 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 11.8 years old. He's uh, very much interested in, in quantum mechanics and asteroid mining. But what some of you don't know, uh, he's also plays classical guitar. I've seen his YouTube, 
and he's a painter and he's probably been inspired some by Ron. And, uh, and I've seen some of his work. He sent some of it around, so many of us have seen it and uh, quite spectacular for 11.8. I can't wait to see what you do when you get as old as 11.9. So uh, with that said, Arjun, uh, unmute yourself. And I'll, and I'll guide your slide. You just tell me when to move. And um, you can talk about your uh, topic here on quantum tunneling and nuclear fusion. It's all yours. OK, thank you. Uh, so, oh, is this oh, the oh, Hang on a second. Where'd your slides go, Arjun? Uh -huh. OK. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I apologize. Hang on, gang. Wow, your slides disappeared. Hang on, now, give me a second here, Arjun. Okay. Let me see what's going on. Talk amongst yourself, gang. I am. Um... So actually, before I started, I was going to talk about a part where I would thank Mr. Phil for um, allowing me to give this presentation on this um, monthly meeting. So uh, thank you, Mr. Phil. And I'd also like to thank all HAL members for hosting the monthly meetings and encouraging me to go down my scientific path. So I'd like to thank everybody in hell. Oh, hey, so uh, yeah. um, that was my speech. I don't uh, have anything yeah, else to say. Arjun, I love your questions in the meetings. Thank you. Thank you. I did too. Thank your you. Your help on Discord, Arjun, you're awesome. Thank you for all the compliments. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to continue doing this, and my lifetime passion is eventually to become a scientist and help the world in some way. So I feel like I'm going to start out by doing this. So thank you, everybody, for the compliments. Yes, I got to I'm getting there. You got to... Um, what's up here, one sec. We're gonna have to scramble here. I don't know what happened. I apologize, but All right, who's, got an, who's got an astronomy joke? Arjun, do you have your slides on your computer there? Oh yes, I have my slides on my laptop. So. Could you share, could you bring them up and share your screen? Okay. Hey, okay. Just a sec. I'll pull it up. I'm currently not on that. Okay, I have it up. Okay. Could you know how to share the screen? Yeah, I know how to share the screens at the bottom. Okay, well, I'm not surprised. Okay. Okay, and I'll get them added in uh, in time for the, um, when I send them up to, uh, to Mr. Ken there to uh, post it. Okay, so okay. go ahead and share your screen. So I'm going to share. Um, just a sec, let me turn it to present mode. Okay, so yeah, there it is. So today I'm going to be talking about a concept called quantum tunneling and nuclear fusion. It's confusing at first, but this presentation is going to go over um, what exactly it is. So, yeah. And I also um, gave my speech. Thank you, Mr. Phil, for um, allowing me to give this presentation this month. And also, I'd like to thank all HAL members for bringing me down my career. So thank you. Um, so first, an overview. I like everybody to rift through their memory and see if they have a memory written quantum mechanics on it. Because if somebody has, then I'm sure that they would have heard that quantum mechanics is something about particles being in two places at once and light being waves and particles. And even me, sometimes I've thought that it's all just absurd and it's not real. But it is real. Everything which quantum mechanics predicts is real. And it all comes down to the very lifeblood of our sun. So, okay, wrong slide. Okay, so there. Um, I'd first like to talk about the sun's implications. So as everybody knows, all life on Earth runs on the sun. Um, and without the sun, none of us would be here. So the sun is very important. And even the sun runs on a process which is called nuclear fusion. So nuclear fusion is where the center of a hydrogen atom collides four times to form the center of a helium atom. 
the next slide will go a bit more in depth. But this process, which um, in which the nuclei collide together, has been keeping the sun running for about 4.5 billion years. And in another 5 billion years, the sun is going to eventually puff up and then shrink down to a extremely dense and bizarre neutron star. But that's a very long story, so I'm really shortening it down. So this is the slide on nuclear fusion. So uh, nuclear fusion starts in the very hot center of the sun. The sun's inner core is about 15 million Kelvin. That is very hot. So the sun's core is hot. And classical theory, which is the theory predicted in the early 1900s, is a theory which says that since the core is very hot, it causes the particles to fuse into each other, just like that. And the high pressure and the very inhospitable conditions of the sun allows for this nuclear fusion to happen. But, okay, before that, so um, this nuclear fusion takes place in the center. And when two of, I mean, when four of those helium nuclei collide together, it is going to form, it is going to form and release protons and a flurry of other particles. So when the hydrogen nuclei collide, they release a flurry of particles. And the most valuable for us are the photons, which are the light particles which come from the sun. So when those flurry of particles are released, they have to go through many obstacles because the sun isn't empty. It's full of free electrons, protons, and neutrons. Those are particles, subatomic particles. So light has to go through every one of those particles, bumping in and out and in and out. And this bumping of particles is what the scientists call the random walk. And the photons, once they're done bumping and they come out of the sun, it takes them just about 150,000 years, give or take. So the light which we see today is 150,000 years old. That's pretty old. So that is nuclear fusion summarized. And you can see in the GIF over there, um, that is an example of the random walk, except that you're going to have to do this many millions and billions of times before it comes out of the sun. And that's why it takes so long. So now here's the problem. So first of all, if we think a bit logically, we said that four hydrogen nuclei are colliding together in order to form a helium nucleus. And as everybody knows, opposites attract and the same repel. So since protons are the same particle and they have the same charge, they have to repel. Why are they fusing into each other and forming a new particle? That doesn't make sense. But what I said, the really hot nuclear fusion can happen if the sun is 100 million Kelvin hot, if its core was 100 million Kelvin hot. The controversy is that our sun is barely 15 million Kelvin. So with these problems present, the fact that the sun still exists is kind of strange because according to our theories, it's not supposed to be fusing right now. And there comes the quantum twist, something quantum is going on. So before I go into the solution, I'd like to talk about what quantum physics is. So quantum physics at its most fundamental level describes how fundamental particles act. So fundamental particles are very small particles which can't be broken down anymore. They are what make up matter. So electrons, protons are all fundamental particles and they are what make up everything. And quantum theory describes it. And there is a set of mathematics which comes 
with quantum theory. And that is the mathematics which predict all of the bizarre things we should have heard of, with including the particles being in two places at once and light being waves and particles. And out of all these bizarre topics, we are picking out one called quantum tunneling. So what is quantum tunneling? So quantum tunneling is where a particle has enough energy to go through a barrier like a ghost. So let's say that this, this um, Jupiter is a particle and this poster is a barrier. In order for this ball to cross through the barrier and go to the other side, it either needs to jump over or it needs to make a hole through this poster and go out. And either of those actions take energy, some amount of energy, because you can't jump effortlessly and you can't go through a poster effortlessly. You need to use some form of energy. And just like that, quantum tunneling is where a particle goes through a barrier and when it goes through that barrier, it uses energy. The only difference here is that instead of the particle jumping over or making a hole, it just goes like a ghost right through it. And this theory is known to happen at very fundamental levels. And so if a particle has enough energy to cross through a barrier, whatever it may be, it it's going to cross through by using its energy. And what's left over of the particle after it uses the energy is the corpse of it, how much energy it has left. And this is the quantum tunneling theory. And so next time the particle wants the quantum tunnel, it's going to need to find a barrier which is less than the energy which it has. Because if the barrier has more energy than the particle itself, it can't go through. So that is what quantum tunneling is. So finally, the solution. So as we said before, quantum tunneling is where particles have a very low chance of going into each other. And this is where our nuclear fusion problem comes in. So when two particles are coming near each other, then they have their repelling force, the force barrier, which is between each of those particles. So what happens is the particles have more energy than the barrier. So they cross through and they finally fuse to form a helium nucleus. And so this is how the sun runs and the fact that particles can tunnel through each other. And so, yeah, so that's how the sun runs. And that is how the sun has been shining for 4.5 billion years. So a conclusion for everybody. So now quantum mechanics has come out of the darkness um, and it stated itself to you. And it has finally told you how it works. So just a brief recap of what's going on. Nuclear fusion is where hydrogen atoms, four to be precise, fuse together and create a helium nucleus. So the next point is that the normal classical theory does not describe nuclear fusion properly. So quantum mechanics comes to the rescue. Quantum tunneling, which is a property of particles, mm. allows nuclear fusions in more hostile conditions meaning at more lower temperatures. You wouldn't want to be in 100 Kelvin compared to 15 Kelvin. So it allows it at more lower temperatures. And finally, quantum tunneling is where particles use their energy to jump over barriers. And in this case, it's the repulsive barrier of two particles, which the particles in the sun are jumping over. And so with that, I'm concluding my presentation. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Arjun? I think right off the bat, I want to say that I think Arjun has a really, really remarkable talent for explaining science. 
And this is a very rare talent. Not many people are capable of clearly explaining scientific concepts to say lay audiences. You know, Carl Sagan was brilliant at this and it's a rare talent. I think you do this extremely well. Thank you very much. I didn't prepare much. I prepared in a hurry right before the presentation. So. Well, let's let's wait, 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 wait. That's not fair to yourself. Arjun's been working on this for weeks and he's been sending me stuff and I gave him a very, very tough challenge because I told him he's only got 15 minutes to present a very complex topic. And, and so not only did he have to prepare it and then I reviewed it and asked him to add things on to help explain it a little further. And, you know, talking about fundamental particles, Arjun, like you said, they're, you know, as, you know, like quarks and things like that, smaller than uh, electrons and protons and things that make them up, right? And so I wanted to make sure that not, you know, not everybody on the call has studied quantum mechanics and maybe not even know what it is. So he had to do a very fundamental, quick job to give an understanding so everybody could kind of keep up with where he's at and, and, and learn something. And he did a fantastic job. Um, you know, he, remember, he's only 11.8 years old. He is not 11.9 yet. So uh, that was just great, Arjun. Anybody have any questions for Arjun? Just unmute yourself and go ahead. I'd like to see some of your artwork. Oh, my artwork. They're in my room. It's the basement <laughs> across the hall. I'm going to get it. Maybe next time. Oh, he's going to go run and get it. Okay. okay. In the meantime, while he's doing that, I'm going to switch over um, and bring up the, uh, the images that uh, everybody sent me here. And uh, he can jump that back in there. Let me bring this up. Get us back over to where we were. Um, okay, I'm back. Yeah, go ahead. So, that was a quick scary. Um, so this is one of my pieces. It's I drew oh, spider. Brilliant. Thank you. It, it's a bit of a classic. Everybody liked it. I even liked it myself. So I decided to present it to everybody. And um, looking through my sketchbook here. Uh, okay, this might be one of my um, drawings on the better side. So uh, this is a deer, which I drew just last year or so. I feel like Excellent. I feel like the details may have been smudged by the paper on the other side, but. Yeah, it's still good enough. And uh, finally, I was asked to draw the difference between an animal before global warming and after global warming. So I, I drew a snake. I know that snakes are kind of scary to people before, but this would be a snake before global warming. And after global warming, I came up with a theory for why there should be an ear and a proboscis <laughs> on the snake. So good, good thinking. That's some of my artwork. Thank you. Right. Yeah, and this is Thank yeah, you this is much. one last piece of artwork. I drew this yes. for one of my friends. One more, one more. Very see. much. This was Mr. Joel Goodman's eager friend. Oh, nice His painting. Gordon. I like it. Thank, thank you, Arjun. I can't wait to pick it up in a couple of weeks. Yes. Very good. Very thank good. you, everybody. All right. Let me go over here and uh, get this back up in presentation mode. More quick. There we go. We should be good. And okay, so. Got about 20 minutes here and Victor, you are up. This is my favorite of all your uh, your Star Wars shots there. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm not sure I can follow the last act here. But, <laughs> well, nobody can. Um, so this is, um, it, it. we started out with art and then we went into some science and now we're back to art. Although this kind of looks like, maybe these could be particles. Um, this is actually a one single photograph of the double cluster. It's a 60 second exposure where I used a, um, um, a, a little motor, a stepper motor to change the zoom on the lens while I was exposing. So it's about 30 seconds at uh, 200 millimeters 
And then over the last 30 seconds of the 60 second exposure, I was adjusting the focal length down to about um, somewhere between 70 and 100. So the effect is the um, the effect is the uh, you know the Star Wars uh, warp speed or Star Trek if you if you like warp speed. Uh, the thing I like about it is sometimes when you photograph a star, you really um, saturate the color, but when you spread it out, you, you can see the tails the focus as you as you as you change the zoom the focus goes out and it diffuses the light and you, you really can see the the colors i did i did uh, you know enhance the saturation and whatnot in post post processing but anyways that's the that's the double cluster with the a focal length um adjustment mid mid uh exposure very cool thank you thanks you're welcome all right, so I have um, uh, my screen here is being blocked by my images of you guys. Uh, who's, who did this one? This is uh, mine, Brad Sheard. Yeah, go um, ahead, Brad. So this, is, so this is a dumbbell nebula I shot this past fall, but uh, what's interesting, it's mostly narrow band with some RGB for the star colors. Um, what's interesting to me is I was able to find online a a spectrum of planetary nebulae you can see on the lower right. And so if you look, you see that it's completely dominated by oxygen, which of course is the blue or teal color here. And you can really see that outer envelope. Well, what's even more interesting is if you look at the, um, where the H alpha is, what we normally use for an H alpha filter, it's actually dominated by nitrogen in this case. So there's two nitrogen lines and a hydrogen line that fall within the band pass of the filter. And then if you look to the right at, there's a tiny, tiny little peak for sulfur. Uh, I didn't use the sulfur emission in the picture, but you can see it actually shows up in an image. So, and you can see, I kind of inverted the individual channels on the upper right to try and bring out the outer halos. Um, so that's my version of the dumbbell. Very cool. Thank you. That's very cool. Chuck. All right. Well, good evening. Uh, thanks for including this. Uh, you know, it's been been quite a journey, but uh, since October, I've finally finished the integration of my telescope out in a remote facility out in California. I've called it the Super Solemn Observatory, meaning beyond our solar system, primarily because the work I've enjoyed doing is uh, things like uh, eclipsing binaries, and in this case, uh, supernova imaging. If you remember, uh, uh, Purdue University's uh, Danny Milosavljevic, yes. uh, who uh, presented to us this past fall. Uh, the image on the right was actually done for Danny. Uh, so that is one of the Zwicky transient facility alerts. I just took that image a couple nights ago. Danny had me following up on that supernova for him. Uh, and uh, purpose, obviously, is they're, they're doing the, uh, the light curve, photometry for light curves uh, for supernovas. The one on the right, or I'm sorry, the left is a, a Gaia alert from just a couple of nights ago. Uh, very prominent uh, supernova, which I followed up on for many nights. These images, uh, they're, they're both type two supernova, which are core collapse supernova. Um, both of these are uh, three stacked images, 240 second images. So, you know, not a long exposure. Uh, Slonar filters, uh, what I've been using. And just FYI, AAVSO is moving towards Sloan uh, uh, photometry. Uh, so those of us who are supporting the uh, uh, the sequence team are, are now uh, starting to put Sloan filter data uh, much more into the uh, uh, into the sequences that are being done. Uh, the last point I'll make here is uh, of interest, perhaps for those of you on the artistic side, and not the you know the astro imaging for science purposes. Uh, that image on the, the left from, uh, from the Gaia alerts, if you're just ever looking on any given night that you just want to look at some distant galaxy and find a supernova, uh, there's a, a website from the University of Cambridge that does Gaia alerts and you can find something that's going on. And just about every night there's uh, several supernovas uh, you know, that are visible if you're ever looking for something to image. So I just pass that along. Very cool. I really love the uh, diversity that all of you bring uh, to the group here. 
So now we have a series of moon shots and they're very interesting. There's a lot of moon work done this time. Uh, and uh, Jim, you're up first. You're on mute. You're still on mute. Hey, Jim, you have to unmute. There you go. There we go. Yeah, this is a, um, not anything special. It's more about a journey than the actual picture of the moon. I started out shooting the moon with um, a monochrome planetary camera. And um, I wanted to advance the color because I just kind of like the feel of a color image of the moon. And uh, doing that with a monochrome camera and filters, this wasn't coming out too good for me at stacking artifacts, the different, um, uh, different pieces of the mosaic just weren't coming together, right? So I got a one-shot color camera and this is um, a shot with, with that, um, where I hope to go from here is to do mineral moon type uh, photos like uh, James Willingham uh, posted just a couple of days ago. But I got to get some color noise under control before I can do the deep saturation. Very good. You're a good straight man, too, because there's some of those images coming up next. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. There's Greg's shot. Greg, you on? Yeah, um, so this was just my first attempt. I just started getting into the astrophotography stuff and uh, I've been waiting on a telescope for over a year now. So I'm using a smaller telescope to practice uh, with taking pictures of uh, planets and nebulas and those kind of things and learning how to do tracking in that. Uh, so this was my first attempt at a, uh, a uh, mineral moon. Uh, I really like the colors, you know, of seeing you know, the moon versus the the uh, standard white. Although the picture that was posted a day or two ago about the snow moon, I thought was really, really pretty. Um, so I'm learning a lot. I'm using a uh, a uh, ASI 240, uh, 224 uh, color camera for this one. And the thing I learned most out of this was how to process uh, FITS files and learning how to, to uh, debear a uh, FITS file correctly. So thanks for sharing. Thanks. You're welcome. Great job, for, especially for our first one. <laughs> Nothing to be ashamed of if it was many of them. There you go. Uh, I believe this is a, is this a James shot? Yeah, James, I don't know if James is on, but here's his shot of the mineral moon. And then here's a picture that I uh, captured um, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago. I had it up and there was a lot of comments um, and uh, especially from Bob Prokop, he saw some features up there. And one of the things that's very interesting is you could take an image of the moon, the same features over and over again, but at different uh, parts of the, uh, the cycle there and you get different shadows and you can really see um, features that you didn't see in, in previous images. So it's pretty happy how this one came out. That was mine. And then, okay, so now moving into some of the sun stuff. So this is a picture that I uh, captured the sun using my 60 millimeter launch hydrogen alpha telescope. And as you can see, there's uh, quite a few features going on ar around the edge. Remember this is with 60 millimeters. Um, the large uh, white uh, area, um, you know, remember with the, um, um, with the H alpha scope, we're looking at the chromosphere. And you know, if you're using a white light, you look at the photosphere. So your sunspots look different, but that area right there in the center uh, north of the equator there, um, the, the, that's over 250,000 miles in length. So that's a very hot spot. That white area is called the plage, which is French for beach. And um, uh, so there's a, you know, I'm looking forward to more and more images of the sun because it's uh, so active right now. So you see all kinds of spicules and um, um, prominences and there's a loop prominence coming around there. Um, so a lot going on on the sun. And here's Kurt. Kurt. Hello. There well, you are. Did, didn't know I was gonna have to talk. So, um, but I, I guess what I would like to say though is <clears throat> if it weren't for the help of some folks like uh, John Nagy and Brad Martin and Steve Rifkin, I would not be taking images like these. The, uh, they've given me a lot of help, a lot of direction, a lot of advice. And uh, 
this is about a two hours worth of oh, 60 second exposures. And uh, if you would have said something to me a year ago, if I'd be taking two hours, I, I would have thought that was crazy. I thought hour, one hour is long, was a long time. And then I watch what they do and they do six, eight, 10 hours. So eventually I'll catch up to them, yeah. maybe. <laughs> Yeah. Excellent. Hey, Jared, are you on? I'm here. Okay, so when we get done with the images, I'm going to go back to the Discord, okay? Sounds good. Okay, thanks. Kurt, you're still up. Oh, boy. Uh, just more of the same. Uh, actually, gosh, I, I, this one might have only been an hour. I, I don't really remember right now, but um, <clears throat> the, what really helped this image was learning how to process and fix insight. And uh, that really, I was able to, uh, the original image had a burned out core, but uh, through the, the processing that I learned, it was able to bring out the uh, interior so it wasn't so burned out. But thank you. Very nice. I think you might have one more. There you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, one more. Uh, this was, uh, I was up at Alpha Ridge. I actually wasn't planning on imaging this, but the moon was too close to what I really wanted to, Take a look at so i just spun the scope around and thought i'd give this a shot and that might be a couple hours worth of uh data yeah yeah very nice thank you and hey, brad hi there yeah so uh here's um the same couple of galaxies m81 and m82 uh this uh i did um with a mono camera um mostly uh, well, I wouldn't say mostly because it's about four hours of luminance and then about an hour of uh, R, G, and B. And then I also did the rest. It totals like 10 hours and the rest of it I did in uh, HA. So I really like how in M81 on the right, you can see all the red in there. That's that's like all the emission nebulas that if our viewpoint was from inside of that galaxy, that's like the stuff we'd be taking <laughs> pictures of. Um, and you can see it from another galaxy. It's pretty rad, really. There you go. You're still up. Uh, yeah, so this is my Crab Nebula M1. Uh, this is uh, a narrow band. Um, uh, this is about six hours to each of hydrogen, uh, oxygen, and sulfur. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of, kind of small, but, I, you know, I, I think it, Kind of looks nice with the with the big star field around it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And then uh, this is your last one, I think, for today. Yeah, this is the jellyfish, which is um, like the crab nebula, a supernova remnant. Um, and uh, this uh, again was in uh, SHO. Um, I used a, a a different palette with this uh, to make it more red. I have like a Hubble palette version of this. Um, this is a palette called the 4X palette. It's like a modified uh, HOO palette that gets to keep the, the sulfur. Very nice. And uh, you know, what a way to end up our pictures here with our own Arjun. Thank you. Um, so this is my shot of the tadpoles nebula. Um, this is my first selective color approach. I um, thought of doing the SHO approach, but I just decided to go with the um, HOO red and blue. Very good. Uh, so this is the bubble nebula reprocessed. Um, I'm not liking some of the purple artifacts outside, but I still like the detail which I brought out on the bubble compared to my previous version where the bubble wasn't as prominent, so I liked it for that. Yeah, no, we're watching you uh, get better and better every week here, every month. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, this was an image which I was holding back for a really long time because only some time ago I learned the um, selective color process. So I um, used my selective color. This was my first selective color image, and I did a bunch of um, nebula with selective color. Um, so this is my first one. I really liked um, how the heart turned out. I used to call it the red slug, but now that the slug is brown, <laughs> the brown slug is what fits. <laughs> yeah. Great. 
So I'm going to go back. Thank you. Those are the images. Hey, Jared, um, I go back to your slide there. Um, in the last few minutes that we have before we have to disconnect, um, why don't you uh, give a description, you know, talk about what you're doing with uh, Discord. Oh, there we go. Is that it? There you go. Um, it's all yours. Thanks, Phil. So you took a screenshot for me. I, I appreciate that. I also share my screen. I don't think I'm doing that just yet, um, as you are, but I can walk through what we're doing in Discord. It may make more sense. Can you, uh, can you let me share my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let me uh, get right over here and uh, we'll be able to do it in a second here. We should be good. Thank you. In a few seconds. Yep. Okay, uh, hopefully you're seeing Discord now. Um, is everyone seeing it? Yes. Good, okay. Yeah, so just, a, I promise just a few seconds here. This is just a, a good timing, right? Towards the end, um, we, we shared some pictures as a group um, and you know through the Zoom meeting and Discord essentially is a way to kind of continue the conversation after the Zoom meeting, meeting ends, if you want to look at it that way. We put this together, um, I guess would be back in October timeframe. And uh, we have a small group of HAL members that are in there now. Um, it's been a tremendous, I think, opportunity to really, really leverage the community um, for astrophotography, for equipment, uh, everything. I think almost anything has been brought up in Discord and uh, has been a great way of kind of sharing information. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with Discord, it's, it's really a very simple application. Uh, there are many channels, uh, and the channels are kind of labeled uh, as appropriate. So we have discussions about you know, imaging uh, as a group, maybe things we're running into. We also have, uh, you know, an in the field channel. So when we're out actually doing astrophotography or we're out in the field, um, we're able to ask questions, see how other folks are doing, check the cloud status in different parts of Maryland. Um, so lots of really fun collaboration. Obviously, we're all struggling sometimes and need some help. Um, so there's forums for that where we have a lot of experts in the group. And uh, usually, if you ask a question in there, people jump on it pretty quick and we're able to uh, get people pointed in the right direction. One other thing that's been a lot of fun, uh, I know it's been brought up in some HAL meetings, but the idea of doing some processing challenges and sharing data is happening. So we have a processing challenge once a month where we share data. Some of the members of the group will upload some data to a Google Drive. We'll pull it down and then we'll submit our pictures and learn from each other and how we go about processing. Uh, you can see here just outlining some steps and, and seeing what other members have done in terms of contributing uh, the same data and processing it differently with different techniques. So with that, right, just lots going on here. Um, I will put an invite um, in the uh, in the chat link. If anyone wants to click on that and join, um, feel free to jump in, ask questions, and uh, join the community. And you know, it's a free application. So I think. Uh, and also, if you're uh, if you're a Nina user, uh, there's a double advantage. Not only can you communicate with the HAL members that are in the HAL Discord uh, community, but there's a Nina server as well. Um, so if you're not using that, you use the link. This is a great resource for those of you who are uh, trying to get caught up. So anyway, with that, I'll stop, Phil. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer it. Otherwise, I'll just post the link and uh, help you out in Discord if you need it. Yeah, this was great. I, I mean, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that this was going on um, until you had sent me that notification. And, you know, this takes care of a big problem we had for a long time. Uh, with you know not overwhelming the email box and being able to do you know this kind of collaboration is just fantastic. So we'll look forward to the link and you know the way it's categorized and everything. Just awesome. So with that said, I have to be out of here. Uh, the building's open, I think, just for me right now and all of you on Zoom. So um, they're going to want to go home. So I'm going to thank everybody for joining. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing you at the star parties and maybe here in person next month. Um, and um, that's it. So 
I'm going to have to disconnect the call and everybody have a uh, great rest of the week. Clear skies. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you all presenters. Is the Discord link on the chat? Because I never saw it. In the room. Well done, Phil. Never saw the Discord link. It's going to send an email. Oh, okay. All right. Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody.